So we're very excited to have everyone here today. I'm going to show you a couple fun facts for your entertainment while Michael and I are getting ready. Uh, my name is Byron White. I'm the founder of Writer Access and Ideal Launch, our parent company. Uh, we're very excited to have Michael join us today. Michael, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right on. So, Michael, your your company, Curata, is one of the experts and leaders in the with regards to content curation methodology and technology. So, we're 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 super happy to have you on board here today to straighten us out and guide our ship in the right direction. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Right on. I'm going to run through uh, my deck, uh, which you're going to see in, in a few minutes. Um, and it's going to take about 10 or 15 minutes to spin my way through that. I'm going to try to offer some tips and advice um, on content curation from our perspective here at Writer Access as it relates to both writers that are tuned in today as well as uh, the clients that are uh, looking on board to kind of get a feel for what's, what's, uh, what's happening in the curation world and particularly duplicate content issues, etc. Um, but a couple words of uh, wisdom as we pass along. Michael will have a much more uh, in-depth presentation about pirating issues and best practices, which I think you're all going to enjoy. I took a look at the deck and it's really great stuff that Michael's put together, so thanks for that, Michael. Mm -hmm. um, yep. But a couple of, couple of ground rules for you. Uh, both Michael and I love hearing your love. <laughs> Um, we like doing that on Twitter. Um, you'll see that uh, if you can send me uh, at Byron White uh, how you like the presentation or even what you don't like about the presentation, it's, get to, it's great to get some archived feedback uh, from you. So you'll see some links to that. Um, and uh, um, we also will field some uh, Q&A at the end of the presentation today and really hope that uh, you might ask some questions throughout the presentation, which I'll be monitoring. Uh, and I'll throw out a quick answer to you after I speak, um, while Michael's speaking, if you ask something. We'll also get to those questions in the end so everyone can, uh, can learn what you're learning uh, with the questions. So please, please, please fire questions. Any questions would be great. Love the connection and the communication. Uh, so without any further ado, um, well, one more announcement. There's a really cool new tool in here that uh, we put up uh, just for this presentation that's a great topic finding tool. So you'll uh, have access to that in just a few minutes and that will be fun for everybody to play around with. It's free um, and allows you to pop in a keyword phrase and get some, uh, some suggestions. I'll explain that on, uh, on topics that you might create content around. It's brand new, just launched live today, so we look forward to everyone trying that out and kicking the tires. And, giving us a, 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 some feedback on that. Um, so, uh, so that's what, um, what um, I'm looking forward to talking about. So let me carry on here and move through this. So you already know who I am. I'm going to walk through sort of some quick curation methodology and technology and give some of everyone a feel for the big picture of what's happening out there right now. Uh, we're also going to look at some curation bad practices uh, and some curation best practices, and then I'll turn things over to Michael. So let's look at the first challenge we have here, and that's to understand where where curation fits in the overall content marketing workflow. Um, this is a screen grab, uh, actually, from a site that uh, the Idea Launch site, which we had uh, up and running for many years as a full service content marketing agency. Uh, we first discovered the power of curation and its critical element. Um, as we were building out content plans for customers uh, that would pay us a lot of money to try to figure out how much content we needed to create for them, how frequently we should be publishing it, where we should be publishing and distributing it, how good it should be. These are the challenges and questions, is questions that everyone needs to put into their content marketing strategy. Curation was a separate line item of our pitch to prospect customers and education frontier for the world and, and how we like to explain this process. And this was happening back in 2005, 2006, 7, 8, uh, when we were really a, a full-blown content marketing agency. And even back before curation was even in the, uh, really in the early stages at best of understanding really how it could help you advance your, your business and your, and your workflow. So what we looked at, um, you know, back in those days and even now as we're building content plans is, you know, curating certainly all the content assets out there. 
um, for all the competitors and being very granular with how we dissected all of that content and studying it and looking at it, the quality and the frequency of the publishing. Um, we also looked at just the competitive analysis alone. This was actually supposed to be a different slide, but that's okay. We looked at the more granular nature of that, breaking out all the assets into different groups. Imagine that's the slide you're seeing. Um, and we also, of course, curated what's happening in the SEO space, uh, page rank, inbound links, you know, what what is really happening out there, you know, with regards to a particular domain name in, in comparison with others. And here's uh, some of the content asset breakdowns that I was referring to. We would need to look at lots of content assets and lots of different types of content assets and compare that with each of the individual competitors that our companies were looking at to begin uh, even thinking about developing ideas uh, for content uh, creation um, and or optimization. Um, and essentially, when we finished all of that content, uh, we'd roll it up into a plan that made some sense and offered some very specific uh, ROI metrics declaring to a company uh, the, the concrete answers to those questions that I began with, how much content, how frequently to publish it, uh, where to publish it, how good does it have to be. We, we develop a plan saying, okay, da -da, this is how many assets you need in each category group. You know, now go out there and create that content. So as it turns out, creating that content is very difficult. <laughs> um, and as a couple of uh, famous uh, people and copywriters and writers in this industry have noted, writing is in fact not very easy. So clearly, we're looking for inspiration. And I don't, uh, you know, uh, I, I truly understand that and I understand the power of inspiration in creating content. We need examples, we need guides, we need samples, we need references, we need sources, we need to read and comprehend and digest and then morph our knowledge and, our, and, and that information into stories uh, and, and telling those stories really becomes the art of it. So there's a lot of different ways that we create content and, uh, and, and we look for that inspiration you know, ideation and brainstorming uh, can happen with teams or even yourself. Um, listing is critical where we're just list and do brain dumps of ideas. Um, you know, mapping different visual representations of the topics that we could write about, you know, becomes an interesting plan or just boom, creating a rough draft. There you have it. Um, and or of course, storytelling going into more of a journalistic approach with when we're talking more about you know, who, what, when, where, why, um, and, and trying to develop a story based upon asking those questions and doing the research. Um, and what we also learn about that, um, that magical inspiration that writers need to possess and have is that some writers are more of a, an expert in one topic versus another. Versus another. Um, and when you're an expert in a topic, it means you, of course, dove in very deeply into that topic and have a keen sense for not only uh, the quality writing and content that's happened in that space, uh, but, uh, but future exciting topic ideas and that innovation. At Writer Access, we, we certify writers after we begin not only seeing their work on our end from an internal perspective, but we certify their work once we algorithmically start to see customers rate their work as exceed expectations in various topics. And what we're able to do with that is obvious. We can market and promote individual writers that are experts in, 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 in particular topic areas. Um, so that's kind of how we do it and how we market uh, uh, the, the services of our, of our talent by, by you know, promoting their expertise in topic areas. So where do these experts and where do these people uh, you know, find out their information? My guess is they're all using social media, they're all uh, following various blogs, they're following their peers and experts in, in their industries, they're in tune, they're in touch with what's happening in their industry. It's much more difficult to do that if you're a generalist writer um, trying to write content for multiple topics. It's difficult. You're not an expert in that industry. You therefore need to go out and dig and search and find the content. So, so how do you do that? Well, you know, um, for starters, if you're a client, you have a real luxury at Writer Access. You can suggest, okay, writer, pitch me ideas. Um, and 
writers then need to, uh, if they're going to win the project, um, they need to uh, pitch an idea back to the customer uh, that's relevant, that's timely, that's interesting. Um, and the, the, the client then accepts that idea. Um, but most writers need to look, use SEO tools to find the popular keyword phrases that people are searching on. When you find that popular phrase, you can then uh, suggest topics that revolve around that phrase, or maybe a customer is giving you keywords uh, already that you need, that you want to search for, in which case you can use some cool tools. And here's the tool that I mentioned. This is called a topic finder tool. Uh, that is being launched for the first time where you can type in a keyword phrase and it will pull up search phrases that start with how, where, who, um, and what. In other words, informational uh, long tail keyword phrases that are appearing in the search engines as a result of the keyword phrase that you're popping into the search engine. So you can take a look at this tool, try it out. Hopefully it'll offer some inspiration for you to create topics that are, uh, that are popular, that have a high value because they have a high pay-per-click price. Um, this tool is also integrated in with our content planner, which is a whole other story in itself that I'll save for another time. Um, we also have you know, content feeders that have been around for a while. Content feeders are not really that popular these days, um, so I'll sort of skip this over, but uh, you know, for those of you that are experts in topic areas, you know, and have been for some time, you might be using some of these tools to feed in relevant content about particular areas. Uh, there's some other new things happening, quite interesting. There's a company that we're partnered with, uh, with our content planner that provides some local SERP result uh, positions for our customers, um, and they've created a new tool that ranks authors. Um, by city or by keyword phrase, you know, the most popular writers that are creating content around particular keyword phrases. So here's an example of a search where you can pop in keywords, locate your search to the United States, and it will pop up the top bloggers that have written content using those keyword phrases based upon their popularity and the depth of their circles and some other analytical uh, analytics data that they're pulling together. So, you know, certainly following popular authors is another element and looking at what they're writing and what they're creating is another interesting and creative way to curate. Um, and naturally, we're here to listen to Curata today, uh, but there are a lot of curation platforms out there. Some are better than others. Um, you know, so have at it, try them out, use them, uh, you know, start uh, poking at, at the curation process. Um, so what does all this curation want to do for us in the end of the day? It wants to guide our, our creation process and make us relevant, make us uh, you know, certainly um, in the know with what's happening in, in a particular industry or about a specific topic. So let's look over some bad practices um, and you know, all get on the same page with what isn't working uh, and, and what, is, what is essentially a... Uh, an infringement of, of not only the code of ethics we have at Writer Access, but in general, the, the code for professional writing. Um, so lots of duplicate content. I don't even like using the word plagiarism, by the way. I like to call it duplicate um, content. But if you're, if you're duping content or spinning content, you're in trouble with lots of engines out there uh, that will detect that. Um, you know, this is what a copyscape report looks like, a very clear violation where a writer has attempted to spin content. You can see the, uh, the matches are in light gray um, that are being picked up by another website. Um, and it, the writer has clearly grabbed that article and just changed a few things in a few sentences, uh, but you can see the consistency continues to uh, to, to be throughout the entire article. You can open that particular link up and see the full version of the violation, but the net is this is a clear violation and is not tolerated and uh, basically means immediate termination as far as we're concerned. Another thing that you know we're seeing is, is uh, title matches um, where you're uh, you know, you're going out and doing research and someone comes up with nine tips and you're then creating a, an article that parallels there and you're even using the same title. Um, you know, duplicate, if, if you're an author trying to protect your work, you're going to uh, have engines running trying to detect anybody out there publishing work like yours. 
Um, that's just what's happening. It's not just companies like ours running CopyScape to check for writers. It's the original authors checking for duplicates. And you know, because H1 tags and titles of blog posts, for example, are so prominent and are getting actual listings in the search engines, it's very easy to detect this. Um, you know, so beware of title matches. Sourcing is something that's truly remarkable to me that more of our writers don't essentially completely protect themselves by putting in the source of where you may have found uh, some content. Um, that does a lot of, uh, it covers you for starters um, to explain where you source something and I can assure you it it will never and it should never be used against you unless that source is dubious. Um, unless that sort is a spammy website or an easy site that you know collects garbage in and garbage out and is, does not have merit or authenticity for that particular pr profession, that is certainly uh, you know not somewhere where you should be sourcing content anyway. Um, so you know if you are putting sources into your content as far as we at Writer Access are concerned, you're protecting yourself. If you're plagiarizing content with exact matches, that's a different story. Um, you know, so adhere to both, or or uh, you know, understand that that you're in trouble. So, um, so you know, another interesting thing that is happening out there with regards to uh, copyright infringement is writers are, you know, evilly and you know. Uh, call it whatever you want, are delivering the same original article that they created to two separate clients. And in so doing, you are creating um, a, a, a significant problem, which would immediately cause for termination once again. But what will happen as a net result of that is the first client that publishes that content will be the winner. And with algorithmic changes like Panda and Penguin, um, you know, you can really be in a danger zone because the second client that you created this supposed original content for uh, could get penalized um, and could actually receive harm and damage as a result of your duplicate content. So this is a very serious issue that, uh, you know, we all know the ramifications of Panda and Penguin that has cost many e-commerce websites and publishers hundreds of millions of dollars because of this change in the algorithm structure that, that penalize duplicate content and of course other issues like falsifying link popularity. But this is a serious issue and one that will not be tolerated. So all right, so what are the best practices here? So here is a, uh, an, another CopyScape report uh, on our end that shows that a writer has actually put quotations around uh, a particular uh, quote from an article that they wrote. Um, and by doing so, they've completely covered themselves. They have, they have sourced it in the way they entered it. It does show up as a copyscape match, but it, it also ties in with their sourcing and therefore no harm, no foul. Um, sourcing and linking is, is becoming uh, you know, an essential element to the quality of any blog post particular. Um, we are essentially now uh, judged by Google on who we're quoting, who we're linking to, what our sources are. Very few websites, uh, blog posts or content out there, particularly blog posts, are posted without any links. Um, readers expect links. They may not click on the links. They may just hover over the links to see what the links are going to. Um, there's a lot of interesting studies being done right now on the critical element of links and, and belief. Um, Joe Paluzzi made a great uh, post the other day, or I think it might have been a Facebook post, that he said, I don't even trust website uh, blog posts any longer that don't have a date on them. Um, you know, do you think we'll ever get to the day where we don't trust blog posts that don't have links to authority websites? I don't know, maybe. You know, so um, multiple sourcing is, is also relevant and interesting, where you're not just quote, going to one source, but you're, you're linking to several sources throughout the course of your post or your article or your content that are once again validating your command of, of the art of curation and of doing the research and finding the assets out there that are relevant, that are deserve, are worthy of mention in, in the assets you're creating. Um, you know, quotes are certainly important as well as best practice. 
Um, we're seeing this more and more. Um, opinions are also uh, relevant and important with regards to curation in showcasing your opinion about a particular uh, quote that you might have and how you're uh, you know, moving in another direction or th thinking something different, which is really what you're displaying in your writing. Um, but you know, betterment overall is really what you're looking to do. And you know, in many ways, when our customers fill out a creative brief and take the time to do that, they're telling you the tone and the style they want, and it's your obligation to do that. It's great to go research other articles and, and, and go source other references and use curation engines to find the great content. But what you really need to do is to morph that content into, into uh, much better content with the type of voice and tone and skill uh, displayed that a customer's demand. Um, image quotes, I think, are also interesting. I'm sure everyone's seen the data on the importance of imagery um, in, in, in your posts and articles. Um, and here we have quotes aligned with particular people that made those quotes, which are obviously linking back to the post as well. Um, and so finally, we get to this sort of understanding that if you are going to be a premium writer, you need, whether it be a copywriter or, or a tech writer or a journalist, and at Writer Access, we have new, a new higher level certification uh, for, the, for the best writers in our marketplace that we're rolling out in the marketplace as we speak, where we're really putting our stamp of, of, uh, of authorization and validity on quality writers that are uh, continuing to exceed the expectations of customers. And whereas our standard rates are two cents to nine cents per word, ranging in the two to five star level, premium orders start at 10 cents per word and go to as high as a dollar per word. But you need the skills, you need uh, you know, the expertise, you need the engines, you need the technology to make that happen. So uh, without further ado, you can grab this link. Everyone will be getting a copy of, of, of a link to download my free book. But if you want to go grab it right now or uh, after the presentation, you're more than welcome to. Um, but without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Michael. Great. Thanks, Byron. That was a, a great overview and setting the stage here uh, for curation. Let me make sure and show my screen correctly here. Okay. How are we doing? Can you see that okay, Byron? Uh, yes. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. So once again, uh, uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm Michael Gerard. I head marketing at Curata. Uh, Curata is the leading business grade content curation software. And uh, essentially what we're doing is we're helping content marketers to feed their, their uh, content beast, so to say, to feed the content engine. That goes from uh, going out there and finding, uh, discovering great content across the web, uh, bringing it to you, enabling you to create, uh, organize, annotate that content, and then a one-click share out there. Uh, so I think an important thing going into this, you know, we're talking about curation. Uh, the, the intent is really to help complement your own created content. So more specifically, you know, we, we find uh, our most recent research, talking over 500 marketers, that you got 71% increase in content marketing in the coming year. Um, so, so people are investing in it. They're putting the foundation for content marketing with executives in place. Uh, but from a mix perspective, we see the ideal mix folks are targeting is is about uh, almost two thirds uh, of their content being created, about 25% curated and less than 10% syndicated. So content curation is going to continue to play a, a bigger and bigger part as people leverage it to um, take greater advantage of resources because you can uh, help feed that content beast with curated content. Uh, it'll help you uh, supplement the fact that we're trying to consistently create great content and also uh, the buyers, the, your audience, they want to see third party perspectives. Uh, so curation plays a, a great role there. But as, as we're talking about curation, it's, it's really important to understand a uh, little bit about the, the copyright laws and ethics and fair use and, and to help ensure ultimately that, that uh, we're not accidentally pirating content uh, and, and for our benefit as well as our audiences and certainly the, the publisher of the original content. So just to kick us off here, you know, for, we're going to use, a, we're gonna use a, a story going through this whole process. and. We're going to have a marketing Mary here, right, who's, who's uh, sitting at, at her desk um, trying to think, how do I get another blog post out? And I think we can all, all empathize with this, uh, you know, having writer's block and, and trying to f figure out, you know, uh, what do we do next? And I think, Byron, you had mentioned that, you know, in a couple of your slides. And one of those solutions certainly is, um, is you know, reaching out, looking across the Internet, and uh, uh, we could say inspiration or an, an ideation phase 
where you might be uh, looking at Google or leveraging uh, uh, feeds or readers um, or uh, our curation solutions specifically. You know, we have an entire module, Discovery Engine, that goes out and finds this content and brings it back and is uh, self-learning and, and uh, orders your queue by relevancy. So regardless of how you do that, you know, get through that ideation phase. And you can see uh, Mark and Mary here, she, she found a, a blog post, uh, you know, the Content Marketing Pyramid. Uh, coincidentally, it came from Karate Sites. So that's what we have for an example here. She liked what she saw and said, this is great. I want to share this with my audience. And so she re reworks it a bit, um, brings in the similar title, and uh, you know, introduces it. Here's a great post. Puts some quotes on it and sticks it in there. And so I think as many of us, uh, you know, we, we're, we're curating in our work. You know, we, we do it. We, we click publish and sit back. We're excited. We can move on to our next step, maybe take a break, get a cup of coffee. But, you know, then you start to think, well, hey, did I do that right? Um, and did I put the right things into it? How did it read? How did it finally publish? And as we look at what, what uh, Mary did here, you know, uh, accidentally she pirated content. Right? She didn't know it. I uh, wasn't familiar with some of the best practices. And th there are a couple things in here, the title, the contextualization, uh, excessive reproduction, no source. So there, there's a lot of what's in here that, that happened as a result of her curating the piece as she did. And so we're going to go through this in more detail and in a nice structured manner. And I'll offer some best practice tips along the way. So we're going to start off with definition of content curation. There are a couple key parts to it in our definition I want to outline. Uh, then we'll get into uh, fair use copyright laws, and this is for marketers. Now I'll provide some tips. We put together uh, 12 best practice tips in an ebook that's referenced at the end of this deck, and uh, I'm just going to go through about 10 of those tips uh, for uh, limited time. Uh, then finally, I want to provide some, some anecdotes, some specific examples. And uh, we, we've graded some of these, too, to help you understand um, you know, why they're, they go from an A all the way to a, an F. <laughs> So let me start off on uh, a bit of my, my 10 years uh, being at IDC running their, their uh, CMO practice. I always like to start off with uh, a definition just to make sure we're all on the same page uh, on a specific topic. And so the definition we have here for, for content curation, you, you can read through it here. Uh, we've put this together over the past uh, seven or so years that we've been doing this. And, and uh, basically the, there are specific words in here that, that have meanings, and I'd like to go through a couple of those. Uh, this first one, so content curation, uh, it's when an individual or, or a team is involved, right? So <clears throat> an algorithm that's doing it in an automated fashion would be aggregation. And, and you definitely want to have folks that are domain experts, right, that are, that are able to step in here and identify what is the, the best, the most relevant content for an audience. And this certainly gets more challenging as you get into a, a more complex field, you know, for example, a very technical field. The next part of this is, is uh, this individual or team where, where they're, they're consistently doing, doing this curation, right? So it is a long-term strategy. It, it wouldn't be, for example, a museum curator may curate a piece of art, and that piece of art may sit on the wall for, for uh, you know, weeks, months, or years in some cases. So as content marketers, we have to stay on top of an area. And, and that helps us not just to develop our own expertise, but to build a, a trust with our audience. Uh, as we're doing that, we're certainly going out, we're finding it, we're discovering new things, but we're, we're adding value to it, perspective. We're, we're organizing it, we're categorizing it, we're, we're tagging information, we're, we're annotating it and, and putting our own thoughts and viewpoints into a piece that we are curating. Relevancy, high quality, no doubt, right, we want to be selective and I always think about less being more. And then having a laser focus on a specific market, right? Getting that long tail. And this is going to become more and more important, certainly, as, as content marketing continues to expand in the coming months and years. So thinking about that, that definition of content curation and then, and then um, putting it on, on top, layering it on top of a specific process. We, we have this uh, part this where we go out and where we, we find information, right? So... Once again, I mentioned, uh, you know, be it Google or readers uh, or, or feed readers, et cetera. Whatever you're using, you know, to discover that best content. Uh, the curation solutions uh, 
do have some sort of discovery engine. Ours specifically has one that goes out there and, and it self-learns. Uh, so based on what you like and don't like, like a Pandora thumbs up, thumbs down. So do you know, figure out what's the best process for you to go out and find that information. And then as it comes in, you know, think about organizing it for your audience, just like a, a museum curator would do. Uh, and I mentioned annotation and contextualization. We'll get more into that detail. And then get it out there. And this is, I think, where a lot of marketers come up short, right? Market your marketing, right? So get it into your digital property, uh, leverage social media, uh, connect with other folks uh, across the web, and, and really just the curation process on its own is going to help you with connections, especially as you're providing, for example, attribution for the original publisher. Uh, that's going to recognize them as a good source of information, and they'll uh, reciprocate to you in the future as part of that process. Okay, so that was uh, just a, a little bit about the, the definition of content curation and, and uh, high level, you know, what does a, a curation process look like from start to finish? So let me shift now into uh, just, a, a, just gonna be a couple slides here about fair use and copyright. And uh, this is specifically for marketers as we get into this. So uh, while, while copyright protection uh, laws, you know, they're, they're very broad. Uh, but they do have several examples uh, to allow fair public access of copyrighted work. Uh, and one of the ma these main exemptions is this, this fair use statute. Okay. And so let's talk about how this would specifically apply to curation. And so the first thing I want to mention is you know, where fair use can apply. So you, you can see on examples here in the bullets in this slide, uh, quotation of experts uh, in a review or criticism for, for purposes of commenting, of, of contextualizing, uh, quoting short passages uh, in, in some technical works. This might be something you, you had done in college, for example. Uh, using a parody of some of the content of the work parodied. So I think we're all familiar with Saturday Night Live and the, the parody they do of advertisements in movies. And, and certainly a, a summary of an address or an article uh, with some quotations. You know, so these are all areas where, where fair use would apply. There's a lot more detail, certainly, in uh, U.S. copyright law, and uh, I think it's Section 107 of the copyright law that goes into the fair use. But just some real, real high levels here, and, and also this ebook that's referenced at the end of this deck that we did on ethics in curation. It's on curata.com. Goes into much detail here, much more detail. So fair use considerations. And once again, Section 107 of the Copyright Law, uh, it's a gray area, no, no doubt. Uh, so let's look at specifically what, what's in the law, and then we'll go into some interpretations that we took on this to try and put a, a bit more, more, um, more of a framework around it, more boundaries for you. So the first consideration here is, is the purpose and the character of the use, right, including whether it's for commercial or nonprofit. And so, so uh, most of us um, no doubt are using it for commercial purposes, but we could certainly argue in this uh, new realm of inbound marketing and content marketing that th there's a big educational element to it. Secondly, the, the nature of, of the copyrighted work. So uh, for example, uh, repurposing content. Uh, next one, so the, the amount, the substanti substantiality of that portion of, of the content that's being used. Right, v very important part there. We'll talk about that and provide some examples. And finally, various considerations, thinking about the, the effect of the use upon the potential market, <clears throat> right, for that copyrighted work. So an example of this would be, a um, more traditional example is, you know, somebody publishes a book, and then uh, a couple years later, um, you know, I, I, I put out a book, and, and I reference a significant part of that original book, and I even pull a lot of it in there, even if I'm quoting it, you know, and, and referencing that book, you know, I, I could be uh, taking away uh, or impacting the success of that prior book from a market perspective. Okay. So, so that's our, our uh, just high level of uh, of copyright and fair use, and uh, you know, as uh, as it is in, in U.S. law specifically. And, and to make it more actionable here, and to help us out as marketers, uh, we we developed uh, twelve best practices in total for ethical curation. Uh, I've, I've dropped it down to ten here so we can go over it in the amount of time that we have. And I, th I think before we dive into it, just a, a disclaimer. So um, I, I'm a chemical engineer, I'm a marketer, I've done sales, and uh, a bartender at one point, and, and even a CPA. But uh, I've never studied law, I'm not a lawyer, 
okay, for all you uh, Jack McCoy Law and Order fans out there. So uh, for professional advice, certainly uh, speak to your company's legal counsel. So I'm going to walk through our, our 10 best practices here uh, with respect to a, a specific example. You know, thinking back to Marketing Marion when she went out there and, and she found, you know, a, a post that she thought would be of value for her audience. <clears throat> and so the example we we'll use here is, so once again, this, this, the content marketing pyramid. Are you hungry for content? And uh, this is by Pawan Deshpande, who's the, the CEO of Curata, and he came up with these 12 best practices that I'm referring to today. And so this article about the content marketing pyramid, you know, we looked at the next slide and we said, okay, let's take that article. And, you know, if we copied it 100%, of course, that, that would be uh, piracy, right, if you did that. You'd be copying that entire thing. And now I want to step through each of the best practices. And, and you'll hear that there's certainly some uh, similarity with respect to some of the ones that Byron mentioned earlier. And as we walk through each of these best practices, we're going to morph this this base post that we have right here to get to a point where, at least from a curata perspective, content marketing perspective, we think it's appropriate to publish. So the first best practice here is, is to uh, reproduce only those portions of the headline or article that are necessary to make your point. Right? So don't reproduce the story in its entirety. Okay. Now, same setup for all these, these slides that look like this. The best practice on the top and the bottom is from a, a marketer's perspective. You know, why do you do this? Right? So, uh, I mean, ultimately, right, you, you want to be an ethical curator, right? You want to reduce uh, the amount of content that you're sourcing. You want to uh, improve your own credibility as, as an author, right? And you want your audience to identify that, that work that you're curating as to the original publisher, right? So, so very important that you don't bring that, all of that information straight forward. Now, this one, uh, I want to reference the note in the bottom here. So uh, Kimberly Isbell from the Neiman Journalism Lab uh, ha had originated a best practice very similar to this as well as several other ones in here. Uh, so we, we pulled in some of Kimberly's, modified them slightly, and then we added some of these as well. So I wanted to make sure and give her uh, some clear attribution there. Okay, so if you think about Google, even if you do a search on Google, what they bring back, they do a thumbnail of the image, they, they take a part of the whole thing, and they don't give you the whole thing. And certainly it's space-wise that's important, but they're also conscious of the fact that they don't want to bring the whole thing in under their own name, right? And not to mention if you bring something in and, and you reproduce a significant part of it, that it's going to result in duplicate content. And that can really hurt you from an SEO perspective. So what does that mean for our base uh, post that we looked at initially? So we're only going to take the, the highlighted excerpt that you see here in this slide. Okay. And, um, and so we haven't taken the whole post here. Okay. So we took part of it. Second one here. So try not to use all or even a, a majority of the articles from a single source. Right. So you want to limit yourself um, to the articles that you take from a specific source. Right. So you, you, you don't want to just pipe it in from one source. You want to be selective. Um, you know, it, it, it enables you to, to stay on one topic, certainly, but it, it's not good for, once again, establishing your own credibility. You want to add more value to your audience, too, by bringing in other perspectives. Right. Now, our example here is, is one post, so I'm not going to be able to illustrate this, but it's a very important best practice there you should abide by. So always be conscious of the fact that you're pulling uh, information, articles, posts, videos, whatever it might be, from different sources. Uh, prominently identify the source of the article, right? So uh, you do want to demonstrate that, that you've curated content from a variety of sources, uh, reputable ones, and it makes you more, more credible. Okay. Now, this, this sounds pretty basic, right, to prominently identify it, but, you know, there are slews of examples out there where folks, you know, have not done a good job of that. Uh, one of the things that uh, you can see that we did here uh, is, you know, right at the top, so recently, uh, you know, Michael Gerard uh, from Curata published a great framework for how to think about content marketing. A uh, bit of a switch there. I know it was Pawan's uh, initially our CEO, but uh, we had both put this together. So I think this was another post that we brought this from originally. Okay, so I always like to start off by front by saying, you know, um, wonderful post by so-and-so that they wrote, right? So right away you're, you're telling the audience that here, I'm recognizing who you are, and it gives credit to the author as well. Number four here, so whenever possible, I'll link to the original source of the article and, and be very prominent about it, right? 
So this is, uh, I think a lot of folks that first get introduced to curation or think about curation get a bit hung up on the fact that, okay, hey, wait a minute, if I link to the original source, it's going to drive traffic away from my site, right? Um, so it, it may seem that you're giving away your, your valuable audience, but uh, ultimately it's going to increase your credibility. And it's also going to uh, help you to, to establish and sustain a relationship uh, with key influencers out there, and they're going to show you the love back. Also, as an example, uh, you know, so if the New York Times ha has a great article, and I'm curating it, I have a, a, a link, very clear link there. Uh, it's also a good sign that hey, the New York Times, as I'm uh, talking about it and bringing it into my own site, uh, they have an article that supports my own perspective, right? So it's it's increasing credibility. And we got to realize that you know many studies have shown this that our audience buyers, you know the top two sources they look to for intelligence are their peers, and other third party sources you know such as uh, analyst firms, uh, influencers out in the marketplace, etc. And the third is is the vendor. So if you're going to bring in third parties, you know and their peers as part of your content marketing strategy, you know, it's only going to help your case and, and it's going to help your credibility and bring more value to your audience. So let's go back to our example here, and you can see that in the bottom right, we put very clearly to read the full framework with an illustrated example, check out the original post. Now we, we bold it, we put a hyperlink in there. Okay. So you can see we're, we're slowly building out, uh, going from this 100% pirated post to you know, an appropriate, uh, ethically curated piece. Best practice number five. So whenever possible, uh, do provide context, uh, insight, uh, guidance in the material that you use. Right? And so as marketers, you know, wh why do this? So, so the more original content that you can provide, the more, that your market, the, the more of your marketing message you can, you can place on that third-party content, right? So you can draw a connection to your own messaging, uh, to your own organization and, and your positioning, and, and to support it. And also, it, it certainly adds more value from the perspective of uh, you're adding some uh, original insights, some original thoughts. Okay. And it's a great place too. Also, if you disagree with something that somebody says, you know, do that. Um, and they may come back to you if they, if they like your commentary. I always like to say, you know, put put your analyst hat on here. And certainly, from an SEO perspective, that helps out with with putting some original content in there. It's you're creating as part of this curation process. So back to our, our own uh, our own post here. So we had a uh, we had put it in here um, the specific part where uh, there were some quotes in here. We we did some block quotes. It's a good way to demarcate yours versus the source, right? And then as we did that, you know, so that we could separate out the quote quote area from your own text, your own content, we actually put in some uh, commentary there, right? So the framework's important these days. 87% of marketers report that the greatest challenge is they have is publishing sufficient content. Right? So we're putting some thought there. It takes time, but highly, highly valuable. We do it a lot in our contentcurationmarketing.com, our destination site. And, and we've seen you know, over the months and the years that you know, the more original content we put in there, the, uh, um, the more value we get from having that content up there. So number six here. So when sharing images, uh, unless you have explicit permission to share full size, uh, always share an image thumbnail. And at most is a, two key words here, right? So I think uh, you know this is the most you really should share at most from a, uh, a visual perspective, a, a, a picture perspective, right? So just like we said in, in best practice number one, you know, sharing a portion of, of a, an original article uh, is ideal where you want to get to. And so in our post here. You know, we did a thumbnail of the of uh, Curious Content Marketing Pyramid. Now, th this doesn't necessarily mean okay, it's okay to put that because you did a thumbnail, right? But it does put you in a better position from a, a fair use perspective, right? So um, the the best thing to do really is, is to um, either get get approval from the source for that specific image or thumbnail. And uh, what I do, you know, I think even better from a curation perspective is is that you you, you put in a unique picture in there that you've licensed, right? So for example, I, I use Shutterstock, you may use uh, any other type of, of uh, company out there that provides you access to uh, approved images, right? And I, I love to put in some unique image there that's, that's going to capture my view better. It might draw a greater connection between this curated piece and, and the audience that I'm trying to appeal to and to connect with and to better engage with, for example, as part of my nurturing process. 
So best practice seven here, uh, if you're reposting an excerpt from the original article, make sure uh, your excerpt only represents a small portion of the original article, right? So uh, best practice one is just don't republish an entire article. Uh, there's still a lot of latitude here. So what does this mean uh, more specifically is, is that you want to cut down um, the amount that you have in the excerpt. So for illustrative purposes, I took a little bit about uh, from ours. Uh, if you're reposting an excerpt from an original article, make your commentary longer than the excerpt that you're posting. Right? So I, th I think this is, this is a nice one to, as I'm curating, to a bit of a, a check that I want to give more than I take. Right? So then going back to our, our own post here, that you know I've, uh, I've added more here. I've added some more commentary. I've dropped a bit the amount of text that I pulled from it. And so I feel like I'm in a better position here from an ethical perspective, but I'm also adding more value. I'm creating more as part of my curation process. Uh, do retitle it, right? Um, if you don't retitle it, there's the risk that you're going to be competing with the same title on the, the original author, which you just don't want to do. It's not ethical. Uh, it's not fair to that original author. Uh, once again, like adding your own image, you can add your own, your own uh, perspective to that, and you can pull in your own keywords in there. Right, so as part of that uh, inspiration process, there might have been specific keywords you wanted to get at to improve things from an SEO perspective. Okay, so you can see we, we changed the uh, title here in our post. Um, don't use no follows on your on your links to the original publisher's content. Um, so you know, uh, no follow attributes and hyperlinks. They tell search engines not to give SEO credit to the site you've linked to. So basically, they are small tags on on the links. Uh, they were originally developed to, to avoid search engines uh, identifying links and comments versus the links in an original source, original article or post. And, and historically, they, they often tended to be uh, very spammy. So, so don't do that. And um, if you're using uh, any type of solution that's um, curating for you, make sure that there are no follows in there. And so as we look at this, um, you know, the final view here, right, where we went from our original one left to the, the final one and right there, uh, you know, significantly different. Uh, our own perspectives in there, we retitled, we, we took a thumbnail of the image, we did some block quotes. So, so this all may seem, may seem daunting, um, but uh, certainly as, as you do it more and more, you're going to get better at it. Uh, you'll, you'll know what to do when and, and you get more creative and time better with your audience. And certainly it can be a lot of fun. Uh, and for, from a technology perspective, um, you know, thinking back to our curation process, right, where we're, we're finding, we're organizing, annotating, we're publishing, um, and, and even uh, for Curata's curation solution specifically, right, there are things that we've built into the solution that help you with this whole process, right, be it from the, the find part where you're going out and finding great information with, with this uh, self-learning relevancy engine, to the creation part where it enables you to put in a new title very easily. It enables you to, uh, there's automated attribution, right, that'll bring in the, the uh, you know, check out this link uh, to go to the original source, brings in automatically. Um, there's uh, direct SEO attribution built into the solution to help you out, et cetera. Okay. So um, just uh, before we finish up here, I wanted to provide some uh, for examples from the, the top and the bottom of the class, if you will, of, of uh, curation and action. And the first one here, you can see a uh, talking points memo uh, that we pulled in. Stone mentioned uh, direct access and interview with the Guardian. So what they did here is they, they did retitle us. I like the fact they, they cited uh, the Guardian right up front there, which is great. Um, Taking some small quotes, but added their own perspective. And there's good, clear attribution to the original source. So I, I think some uh, really good elements in there. And, and so I'll uh, give that a grade, grade A as, as a result. Uh, Business Insider, see they're, they're uh, pulling together some things that are uh, uh, important links and what's happening out in the industry from a technology perspective. And, you know, there's uh, some good things in here with respect to some, uh, you know, the links are right in there so you can click on it and get the original source. But uh, there's really not, not, not any uh, commentary added in here um, or any insight. Um, there's, there's no real sort of information or value that, you know, an audience would directly pull from this. Um, the, the, a couple of these other areas like, you know, title and pick don't even apply because they didn't even get into that level of detail. So I give them a grade, grade B as a result of that. So it's, this is uh, approaching more aggregation. Next example here is uh, out, out, outsell, right? So um, a curated newsletter. So they take acts, abstracts, uh, link backs, yes, um, but they don't actually indicate the, 
the source uh, in each one of them uh, in the text. Uh, don't add any commentary. And I think that there's a, a lot of value in having that. Uh, so I gave these folks a, a C as a result of those things. The not indicating the source and then the text, I think, is a is, uh, big, big thing there. So as we work down our, our scale here, um, this is an example uh, from Scoop It. And so the user scooped a piece of content. And you know why grade D for this? Uh, first one, uh, the title is the same as the source, right? Uh, which which is um, it, it's not fair to the original author, the publisher of the piece. Uh, pictures full size, which is uh, risking of getting in hot water from a copyright perspective. Post has uh, full content of the article, right? So it brings all the content right in there, which uh, you know as we talked about in, uh, in our best practice number one, bringing that full content in is is really no no. And you can't see it, but on the hyperlink to the full article or source, um, it uses a nofollow link. And therefore, the original publisher is, is not getting SEO credit. Right? And so, uh, so that's, a, that's a really big no-no from a curation perspective. Okay. And finally, our, our last example here from uh, Pex Hill. So you see in the bottom right, um, we had a, a piece in content curation marketing about this content curation and analytics. And what, what was done here is actually the entire article was, uh, was brought in and, and copied by Pex Hill. So uh, we notified them, and um, they, they immediately uh, uh, took it down. But as a result of that, we got a great F. But they've, they've um, resolved that. So if we go back to our, our example, Marketing Mary, so uh, she had taken that, that initial post that, that um, you know, she had inadvertently uh, uh, pirated. She still, still took the piece. She, retitled it, she did a thumbnail of the image, uh, made it clear right up front uh, who had wrote the post, and uh, she put a couple links in there to help the audience. She block quoted the quotes that she brought in from the original post, and uh, put some nice commentary in there, and then bottom right, she had a, a link that went right back to the, uh, the original post. So, you know, th thumbs up there for Marketing Mary. The, the final piece that we have is a good uh, ethically curated piece, and, and it's going to complement well uh, her company's uh, created content and add a lot of value to her audience and bring in that third-party perspective. So just to wrap, wrap things up here, so uh, do curate content, right? As, as we see that, um, you know, many folks historically that, that had a significant part of their content marketing was created content uh, have realized and will continue to realize that, that you need to complement your created content with curation uh, for the benefit of your, of your organization to uh, better leverage resources and. Uh, continue to create great stuff on a more consistent basis, but also bring your audience that third-party perspective. Right. Uh, do get familiar with these fair use and copyright laws. Uh, do check out the ebook uh, that we have on curata.com, and uh, read more about that. Uh, follow those tips that we put in there, and uh, you know continue to learn from not just the practices in here, but uh, you know as, as you look around the, the content marketing space. I think a lot of a lot of us uh, content marketing folks out there, we're, we're always publicizing these best and worst practices. So they're, they're great learning opportunities. Okay, so this, uh, this ebook, um, you know, goes into much more detail, certainly. Uh, check it out on curata.com. And um, also, I, I referenced that content marketing tactics study we just did. Uh, so there's some good data in there. So uh, certainly feel free to check that out. And, um, you know, if we can't get to all your questions today, uh, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to me through uh, marketing at curata.com. Terrific. You can, okay. Great job, Michael. Really fantastic uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> right on. So we've got some good questions that have come in. I want to get right to them and, uh, and fire through them. Let's um, start. Go ahead and stay on your screen if you want. Um, on the example that you had, you had some italic content that I believe was quoted. Someone had a good question, actually. Is content in italics considered quoted? Very good question. Go ahead and answer it if you want. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh -huh, cause it's, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, as, as I uh, probably about a year or two ago first started uh, curating formally, um, it, it was, you know, I, I saw sometimes that it, it was italicized and indented. Um, I, I can't speak from a legal or, you know, or, you know perspective, but I do know personally uh, I think it's important that it is number one, make sure it stands out from the rest of the of the uh, text that's in there, uh, and stand out would be block, you know, having it block quoted, blocked in, having it italicized, and honestly, I try to quote um, when I'm curating, and so I always try to, you know, if I'm unsure, I'll take it to the next step. So I would recommend uh, quoting it, but from a legal perspective, uh, I'm not sure of where that boundary is. 
wouldn't disagree with the answer. Go with quotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, another um, question that, that came up was this concept of um, embedded video and duplicate content within a, an embedded video. Can you comment on that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I, I assume that that would mean uh, if you're sourcing okay. video. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> I guess in the, in the perfect world, you know, and we've come across this a couple times the past six months, right, as we're pulling a video in, and um, I, I'm not sure there, there's an easy way to pull out a snippet, if you will, from a video. You could pull out a little piece and reference it, uh, but it's it's so different than text. So I would say from a, a video perspective, um, you know, the most important thing, at least with today's technology and where we're at from maturity level, is to is to um, just make sure that's sourced really well in the text part. Um, you know, and let let the author know that you're curating it. Uh, you know, and you're still going to have the title, for example, if you're doing a blog post of a video. Uh, so make sure and do a retitle that, and uh, you know, thumbnail an image or, or put a a new image in there. Another question: My competitors steal our content, rewrite it a bit, and don't give us any credit or links. So what can we do? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's not good. <laughs> Let me help you there yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I'll take the first go at this, and feel free to add yeah. if you want. So, sure. um, you know, copyright infringement is a problem, but I believe that you need validation for copyright infringement. Our choice of validation has always been, and for the first foreseeable future, will be Copyscape as 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 a as a tool that we use in the platform. Um, that tool. What I would do in that case, if I were a customer, I would use Copyscape. I would pull Copyscape reports, which would validate infringement, at least partially from a third-party perspective, and give you validation to open up a line of communications to hopefully cease and desist the, the copying. Um, it, it's, it's a real issue, but you have to have validation for it. Um, I don't think you're going to have success from a legal perspective in trying to pursue uh, you know, a, to make a case, if you will, if there isn't a third-party report validating that actual sentences were copied, fragments of words were copied, that were consistent throughout the article, or uh, lots of other variables, um, you know, that, that need to come into play. You need the evidence, um, but if you have the evidence, then you can make a case. And you know, even if that company were using, say, freelance writers to create that content they could instruct those writers to not source your uh, not source your content and put that as a rule um, that would need to be adhered to by writers completing the work um, which could also get an editorial check um, so there are some ways to guard against it and, and act more defensively um, so here's another question, and, and Phil, Michael, did I get that enough to make you happy? Yeah, no, that was that was that was fine. Yeah, I agree with this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, how should curated articles be priced versus full researched articles? Very interesting question there. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, because it's a price-related issue, and it's sort of mm -hmm. what we do for a living, especially since yeah, I just yeah, wrote a sure. book mm -hmm. on pricing professional mm -hmm. writing services. So. Mm -hmm. I would think that that question is not really directed more specifically to what the goals of the content really are mm -hmm. and other variables that need to come into play as you're thinking about how to price content. And obviously, the person that asks this question will get a copy of my book and can read the exhaustive effort that took me three to six months to fan out, which is you do get what you pay for. and. If you're gonna, if if the work that you're asking for is more complex, has higher visibility, and uh, and some other variables like uh, rules and and adherence to certain things, uh, style guides, you know, etc., you are asking a writer to do more work, and they should be paid more for it. Um, I find it hard in the way you worded the question to uh, understand the difference between a curated article versus a full researched article in, in terms of what, you know, to me curated is kind of researched. Um, and 
really they're one and the same. If you're if you're sourcing content, you're sourcing content. If you want the writer to source content, you're asking them to do more work. If you're giving the writer a short list or even a long list of places to share the content, that's even more work. If you're putting rules and regulations on how to uh, actually bring that source content into the workflow, that is yet more rules and regulations, and all of which requires more work. Uh, so yeah, that's I, I would say this. Yeah, these curated pieces, uh, like the example I, I put and ran through in building out, uh, most cases we'll see that level of curation done by uh, either an agency for, for, an, for an organization or the organization will have content marketing folks that will work on that specifically more so, and the freelancers will do the, the full created piece, if you will. Got it, yeah. Um, let's see, I am a client, would love more short articles, but get frustrated when writers want the same fee or rate for these versus original articles. You know, once again, same sort of problem here in that we're, we're seeing not a full-bodied examination of what is it exactly that you want. Um, we have some new things coming out at Writer Access which are going to be kind of interesting. We, we feel like content instructions need to be broken out into various rules. And each rule adds complexity to the order, but also gives the client the opportunity to be pinpoint specifically what the check, if you will, what the approval check will be uh, that both a writer needs to complete as well possibly as an editor checking the work. And this is where things like fact checking or source checking or uh, you know, other sort of variables could come into play for value add that you are looking for with content when you want to order it. But what I love about this discussion is it's, it's getting deeper. I think everyone's getting deeper now with trying to understand what do I get when I pay more? And that's really what the book is all about. Hopefully you'll find it helpful. We're a couple minutes over. Um, let's see. Um, um, any thoughts on curating content for an email newsletter? Thoughts on that, Michael? Yeah, a absolutely. Um, so if you if you think about uh, you know as you're curating these pieces, there there are different digital properties you can send it to. It, it could be uh, into your website. It could be embedded in your blog to complement uh, created posts. Uh, you know, it, it could be into a destination site. And I think newsletter is just another wonderful channel to be able to get folks uh, information too that will draw them back to, for example, your blog post or a, a destination site. And you know, we, we do that quite often with, with our content curation marketing site and uh, even when we send out a newsletter. So I, I think a great way to, to bring value to folks. And I almost think it has sort of a, a personal uh, you know, news feed or reader for them. And you're the, uh, you're the curator of information out there. Great, uh, great answer. Um, is there anything else we didn't cover, David, or a final how do people get a hold of you? And I'm going to have Glenn, by the way, just flip uh, the uh, uh, presentation over to me, Glenn, if you would. Um, I don't think I can do it myself. Whoops. Um, yeah, okay. Boom. There you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, cool. So let me just go here. Somebody wanted a copy of the book. Um, which I have, I guess, right there. Sorry about that. I don't know if you can see that or not. Probably not, but uh, let me see. few slideshows. Yeah, okay. Well, we're out of time, but um, you can go get a copy of my book. Everyone's going to need to get an email uh, right after this presentation in about an hour or two with both a link to the recording and a link to the download. Uh, Michael, any other, any other questions or tips or advice you want to share as we part ways? Uh, I think that's it. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Byron, thanks very much for uh, having me. And like I said, uh, there's uh, information on Curata.com, and certainly reach out to me through marketing at Curata.com or uh, at Michael Gerard on Twitter. Terrific. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Until next month for the 50th <laughs> uh, webinar, content marketing webinar uh, series that we've been running. I'll look forward to that. I look forward to uh, seeing uh, some people uh, chime in again. Thanks for your time, everyone. We'll see you next month. Thank you.